Miss Scott, you're muted. I apologize for that. <laughs> I'll start again. Thank you. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, October 15, 2020. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members. Subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fulfill, participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meeting Act by being able to listen and or view the, those, excuse me, those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's equity committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity, Channel 73, Verizon Files, uh, Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Armstrong, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Present. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Williams? Good afternoon. And Mr. Burke? Yes, hello. Are there any other members on the call? Okay. Uh, George Saris of Fiscal Services is present. Thank you. Thank you. And Kathy, I see that Dr. Brian Scriven is on the call as well. Yes, I see. I have that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. And um, you also called, did a roll call of staff members participating in today's meeting. So um, we'll go right into new business. The first item on the agenda is uh, understanding the requirements of policy 0100. And for that, I call on Dr. Lisa Williams. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so one of the things that I was hoping to do today is to really um, draw a line from the conversation that we had at the board meeting where we took a look at uh, the patterns in special education and take a look at policy 0100 to begin to see the nexus between um, how it is that we're thinking about issues of equity and access and really what the policy calls us to think about and certainly um, the other questions that it might raise about other policies that govern how we provide supports and services in this particular case to students, right? But I mean, depending on what we are talking about, I think this question of the nexus between policy 0100 and other system level policies that govern various aspects of function of the organization becomes like huge homework um, for us to begin to consider as a, commu a committee. Because if the policy one, 0100 is a governing policy, then the application, its application should be pretty clear in terms of, of how we're thinking about it. Um, and then that, that I think positions us to better answer the question that is always asked. And that is, what are we doing? And how do we know that it is effective in terms of disrupting um, the patterns that we see in the data that, that are unwanted and um, unhealthy for students? So if you take a look at um, policy 0100, um, and we think about, and you actually don't have to have it before you, because I'll just share. Um, we think about our students with disabilities, which was the focus of the meeting the other night. There are several requirements that um, certainly have applicability to the conversation that was advanced. So as an example, one of the things that 0100 directs us to do is to think about the use of resources to provide equitable access to opportunities and services, right? And so, you know, what came up were ideas of disproportionality in identification. 
And so a reasonable question might be, so what does it look like for us to actually think about um, the kinds of services and supports instructionally, socially, emotionally, that would prevent students from being identified? And how is that department conceptualizing what that looks like? I, I say these things to say that the data patterns are often very startling. But I think the place where you are, we, you and we are most operative is when we understand the programmatic decisions that accompany the data patterns. And there is a lot in Policy 0100, as it's been reauthorized, that allows us to actually take that policy lens and get closer to understanding programmatically the interpretation. So I just wanted to give that as an example. Another requirement of 0100 that could be relevant to that discussion, and I'm making the assumption that everybody remembers two nights ago when I don't even remember 30 minutes ago. So if it's a little fuzzy, um, one of the additional requirements that could be applicable is to use disaggregated data in a manner um, that shows that you're thinking about the disparities as you're making decisions, right? So a relevant question could be, as we think about the data that we saw the other night, how do those data then become used to make decisions about resource allocation or staffing, right? What is the evidence that we're um, applying the equity lens in that way um, in alignment with policy requirements? And so again, what I would submit is when we think about the depth and breadth of really actualizing Policy 100 um, being an influencer across the system, it is a it's a significant amount of work and, and quite frankly a significant opportunity for for this committee to come to understand where the district is in its equity journey, not just as defined by the numbers or the patterns, but um, by way of the programmatic decisions that um, really have uh, import on the fiscal resources, which tonight we'll take a look at that process. So. If there are questions about what it is that I just offered before we have a uh, have the presentation from fiscal services, um, I, I'd await some feedback. You want me to just, Makita, do you want me to just oh. jump in or you want to acknowledge my hand or how do you want to do it? I see your hand now, sorry. Yes, go ahead, <laughs> Ms. Smith. Hi, Dr. Williams. First of all, I didn't have an opportunity to thank you for your presentation the other night, but um, as usual, I find it very enlightening and I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, I do believe when we talked the other night, we talked about over and under subscription, did we not? So in this conversation that we're having um, as how we impact, um, apply policy 0100, we need to be looking at both over and under. Do you agree? You're muted, Dr. Williams. But I can read your lips. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Okay, so we are talking about both over and under subscription. Correct, right. And and, and if I could, Ms. Mack, um, because one of the things that when, when students are, are under identified, um, and this came up, there was a question that was asked about that. And I thought that, Ms. Pastor, the, the way that you had talked about um, dyslexia and dysgraphia, that was a really good example. Because if I know that, you know, 1% of a population is likely to have that occurrence, and I am looking at African-American students, I'm just going to use that, and I don't see any identifications, then how are we identifying those students? And very often what is happening um, for students who are historically marginalized, they are identified in ways that would move them out of academic supports and into behavioral supports, right? So instead of seeing that this is an academic issue that's about quality of instruction, I've labeled that child a behavior problem. And actually, because of that label, I may be exacerbating the academic issue because they are not getting those supports, they're getting behavioral supports. So your point about should we be looking at ways in which groups are overrepresented and underrepresented is really important. Um, it happens a lot in, in the um, construct of special education with Asian students, right? So this belief that, you know, all Asian students do well academically, I can share, a, so my, my physician is, is Asian and his, his child no longer attends Baltimore County schools. But one day I'm having an exam and he knows I work for the school system and he's talking to me about his kid needing tutoring and algebra. And first of all, I'm thinking, I want to just put my clothes on and be done with this exam. 
<laughs> but my, my, my wondering was, like, so why is he having this conversation with me and not with the people in the building? Well, he's a physician, he's Asian. What are the assumptions that people are making about his child needing support in, in algebra, right? And so your, your point about should we be curious about under-identification? Absolutely, because that's harmful, oftentimes in different ways than over-identification might be. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, I taught at the community college level, and I had in-depth conversations with my students. And one student said, "Miss Mack, I was a problem child. And I said, you know, well, tell me what that means. And then we really got talking about it. And because he could not read well, every time he was getting ready to be called on, he would cause some form of disruption, whether it would be as benign as knocking his book off the desk or flicking somebody in the back of the head. So then the narrative didn't come from about him not being able to read. It was, let's stop what we're doing and address this student's behavior. But it was a, a coping mechanism for him because he didn't want to admit that he couldn't read. That's right. And I mean, what 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 we see a lot in this space around this topic is, and, and this is me sort of pontificating, we want young children to offer treatises on what's happening, right? We want them to come out and give these explanations as to what's going on with them. And one of the things that our um, early childhood education office has been encouraging us to look at is the behavior is a language for students, right? And we should get curious about what children are trying to communicate through their behavior, not expecting them to be as communicative as maybe we expect that adults are. Although I would argue that sometimes we don't do the greatest job in communicating one with another. So the expectations that we have often about our students' connection to the the things that are happening to them are sometimes developmentally not appropriate. So we've got to get curious as to what the meaning of different behaviors that children might engage in are. And I can, I can tell you that there is a significant amount of work that is calling us to think about behaviors in a different way that early childhood is leading. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And um, next is uh, Dr. Hager. I, I just had a quick question. Um, I know we talked last time about the development of the rule that would accompany policy 0100. And so um, just two questions. One is, um, is our discussion meant to help inform that process or are you already mostly there and, and wrapping it up? Where are we with that? <laughs> I'm sorry. That chuckle is because uh, this policy has uh, A through V requirements. So I'm not wrapping it up. But I can tell you that where I am is, and, and certainly, Ms. Scott, we can talk about how you would want this committee to understand um, what's in that the rule as we work on it. Mm -hmm. um, there have been um, designees from each of the divisions who have been identified to begin to work on the construction of the rule, because we're going to have to create subcommittees and really collapse some of these ideas. And, and I think, Dr. Haker, to your point, it will be really important for you all to, to see the rule that's going to govern the policy, because it mm -hmm. gives you a lens into what our working hypothesis is around interruption. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, that does. That um, makes a lot of sense. So um, I, I appreciate that response. And I think to speak to uh, one, the a presentation um, that was done um, at the last board meeting, I felt was was very, very enlightening and um, uh, exceptionally done. And I look for us to use it as a springboard to um, come up with plans of action to uh, address um, the, the items that were brought up. And um, as Ms. Mack spoke about discipline, I was just taking notes, or, or over-discipline or over-identification. I think that's um, something important. And that was also what was talked about uh, at MAPE. Discipline or over-discipline of black and brown students, um, uh, corrections over compliance, or, and um, changing how we discipline or address discipline and trauma responses um, as, as it relates to discipline. And I think that's something that we also that we need to be mindful of, especially considering the environment that we're in and as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, but I, I do want us to address, and I will look forward to hearing more about policies um, as we address the whole child or policies and, and making sure that they're applied or they have an equity lens in them so that we are not causing through our policies um, additional inequities or trauma. Yeah. So. Um, 
and, and to that point, if, if I could just make a connection between some of the work that this committee has done and that conversation, you know, um, the implicit bias conversation runs across our humanity, right? And so we oftentimes associate it with um, policing and interactions in that space. But there's a good body of research that talks about how we read behaviors differently on bodies, uh, skin color, size of the body, like the attributions we make um, are, are connected to the differences in body. And so a part of the work that is not quick work, and certainly, you know, when we see these data, we want things to happen quickly. If I don't realize that I am treating the five-year-old boy who looks to me like he's 10, right, like he's 10, but he's only five, so he's mm -hmm. going to do what five-year-olds do, that it'll be easy for me to send him out refer him for suspensions, and it's not happening consciously. That was one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to just pause and make a connection between um, how important I think it was for this committee to actually have the, the whole board have those discussions, because it, it, our data would suggest that we have to be thinking about implicit bias in many ways um, across the organization, because we see these patterns that just uh, uh, suggest that we are conflating different um, socially constructed ideas with bodies without actually seeing the child as an individual. And we got to figure mm -hmm. out how we, we undo that and stop doing that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, and that leads us right into our second item on the agenda, which is uh, understanding the BCPS budget construction process. And for that, I'll call on Dr. Brian Scrivens, or Scriven, excuse me. That's okay. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Or I should say, you see where I am. Good morning. Goodness gracious. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> so I, I just want, and uh, Ms. Pastor, I saw your hand went up before I started. Was there something else you wanted to say? Okay. You're muted, Ms. Pastor. Okay. Okay. And Dr. Scriven, can, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, just a little bit. Is that better? Much. Thank you. All right, I just turned the volume up. So, so I, I just wanted to kind of set the frame uh, or the purpose for why we're here today. And as you are all aware, uh, I think this may be my seventh month in the position, five months officially, a couple of those months were in an acting capacity. Uh, so the timing uh, of this is outstanding in terms of really uh, hearing from you as a committee uh, with the types of guidance or expectations you would have around this work. We did not come with a formal presentation. We wanted to just really give you a high-level overview of the budget process. And then we wanted to field questions and uh, really use this as an opportunity to engage uh, in two-way dialogue. I wanted to first start off by reading just what the vision of the uh, business services is, just so you had an understanding of what we uh, stand for or uh, what we hold true and dear as it speaks to uh, the lens in which we view ourselves and our work. The division of business services will be a valued partner in providing innovative and professional quality services in a cost-effective and equitable, so we have that word, equitable manner to facilitate safe and student-centered learning environments that promote the highest achievement for 21st century students. So when I say that automatically, what also then comes to mind uh, is resource equity. Uh, part of what we facilitate or support is how do we take conceptualized, um, theoretical visions that multiple offices have and bring them to life through a budget. I, I, I just, I, I use those terms because I want you to visualize that. We are the facilitators of that process. So wait, we do not own that process. We create those templates. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Saris takes the lead as he works with multiple offices in terms of really gaining and, and
and, and getting their insight and feedback on what they feel are the program programmatic priorities that they want to see reflected in the budget. And our job is working through and making sure that the product that ultimately uh, the superintendent approves and we bring before the board is one that reflects that collaborative opportunity of working with all those cross offices. Um, the question becomes, uh, is that product one in, in which we feel truly uh, hits the mark to make sure that all students are afforded a rich, robust, uh, rigorous uh, opportunity to accessing uh, educational opportunities, irregardless of race, irregardless of the schools that they may sit in. So, George, if you want to just kind of please walk the team through the process, that budget process, and team, I'm going through this process the first time in terms of seeing it through a whole year myself. Um, we have many of our union leaders uh, that are going to be sitting uh, at the table from the very beginning this year because we know the importance of them having a voice as well. Uh, and I just wanted to elevate that, um, that that collaborative approach is, is critical um, to really bringing this to life and to fruition. So, Mr. Saris, at this time, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dr. Scriven, and good afternoon to the committee. I know that all of you, except possibly Dr. Hager, have been through our budget process and it's it's uh, it's lengthy. It it essentially goes from July to June, so it it is uh, every bit an ongoing and never ending process. And I know it feels never ending to the staff, um, but I just want to point out the board's budget policy, which is three one one one, and the policy states that the budget is intended to reflect the board's mission, vision, and goals. And uh, of course, uh, that includes policy 0100. Uh, it includes the compass um, and ensuring that, and, and the superintendent's, of course, relationship with the board uh, is, is the primary means by which those priorities are established initially. Um, and as Dr. Scriven said, uh, Dr. Williams is the first superintendent to have involved the bargaining units from the very start in the budget process. And this year, we actually met with them first uh, before we've uh, actually had our meetings with staff uh, to talk about their proposals. Um, and before we get into the process, I just thought I would mention that uh, in practical terms, the budgets of the last uh, three years uh, have focused on some similar groups of students. So programmatic uh, funds have been directed very consistently towards special education, English language learners, uh, social and emotional learning, and Title I schools. Um, and as you probably know, uh, we're currently FY 2021 is a maintenance of effort budget. So this is the first year that no additional resources were allocated to those key groups. Um, and you should also, you, you may not recall back to January, but uh, Dr. Williams' key proposal in his in his initial presentation was more teachers 
and more teachers in the neediest schools. And I just recall the first time we went through the budget with him and he says, well, I know exactly what I need. I need more teachers and I have a plan to deploy them uh, where they're needed most. And unfortunately, be because of the fiscal climate this year, uh, that very important program did not get off the ground as we would have hoped. Um, and I guess that highlights uh, or leads me into the next part of my discussion, which is uh, we are not, we are fiscally dependent. We're fiscally dependent on the state and the county and to a much lesser, well, and to a significant extent, federal uh, government through our grants. And of course, the two largest grants are for special education and Title I. But the fiscal, depend the fiscal dependence is, uh, is a real, uh, it's a, it's a narrow boundary that we have to navigate in terms of obtaining the resources. So as Dr. Scriven mentioned, our role in business services is for the equitable distribution of resources. Getting the resources to begin with is also a challenge. Um, the, uh, and as you know, there's, there's the maintenance of effort law, which indicates that the only local local funds only need to be maintained at the current level. And there's the state Thornton formula, which is still in place from 2003, uh, which takes in a lot more variables. So for instance, the state formula considers the special ed population, the English learner population, the Title I population, um, and and it it balances the funding from the state with, through that lens, and it's been very favorable to Baltimore County public schools. For example, while we only got maintenance of effort from the county, we received twenty four million dollars in increased funding from the state. And as everybody is aware, the, the Kerwin Commission and its blueprint for Maryland uh, similarly um, has, uh, is projected, the way, the way it's currently constructed will also benefit Baltimore County schools significantly at the uh, you know, at the end, uh, through and at the end of, of implementation over the 10 year period. So, uh, and that funding is also weighted to the, some of the criteria um, that the current plan uh, involves, except it really has the added feature of focusing on teachers, professional development and their compensation. So having said that, the, the process that we're beginning now with, uh, with the superintendent having met with the bargaining units will now uh, entertain proposals from the cabinet and their divisions uh, in putting together his uh, his budget proposal that the board will receive in January. And then the board will spend January and February uh, extensively reviewing the budget um, and obtaining a lot of supporting material from staff so that by March 1st, the board can submit its budget um, to the county executive. The county executive will uh, will basically work through staff to ask questions about all of the programs that that are included. And then the county executive on around April 15th will submit his budget 
uh, to the county council. County council will again work through staff uh, and their legend and their in uh, the county auditor's staff to ask additional questions, obtain additional supporting documentation, so that uh, and then we'll have a hearing at which we all attend, uh, so that the third week of May they'll be able to render a final adopted budget. Um, so it's a very lengthy process, um, but the, the funding is formula driven. It's, it's driven by the maintenance of effort formula and the Thornton slash Kerwin programs. Um, and of course, there are some years from the local funding perspective where we have maintenance of effort for two and three years. Some years we get two or 3% more. And again, this year we're back to maintenance of effort. So that constant um, drive to gain the resources really seems to have been key for the last couple of years. And um, this year is notable in that um, we really didn't, under the maintenance of effort provision, uh, we did not even have enough money to implement the 1% COLA that the board uh, agreed to. So the superintendent made about $5 million more in administrative budget adjustments for the current year so that we could provide that negotiated COLA. So uh, we tend to find ourselves in a, uh, in a, in a constant um, effort to, to obtain the resources. And I think probably what the committee is focused on is what are we doing with the resources we have? And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions on that. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Saras. Um, do any members have any questions? Dr. Hager? Um, I was just wondering, I know that the goal is the equitable distribution of funds. Um, have you ever done an audit or an evaluation of how um, how effective that, whatever the approach is, is that you've done in the past has been in, in ensuring that, that the funds are equitably distributed by, and, and what are those, what are those kind of, it sounded like the priority areas where the uh, ESOL students and uh, special education students and things like that. Is, is that, is that true? Or are there other, other special? Yeah. Groups? So those, those programs, um, have been successful in that, uh, funding has increased gradually. Um, sometimes the increase and, uh, the increase is so gradual that it's difficult to make an impact. For example, with English learners, when uh, the population, the student population increases faster than we are able to obtain the resources. So I think in almost every year, for example, that we've received additional uh, English uh, ELL teachers and, and funds for the ESOL program, by the time the funds are appropriated, the growth in that population has surpassed um, the resources that we need. Um, I guess one other area that uh, is of interest is are the school budgets and the schools collectively just have their basic budgets before we allocate magnet funds and Title I funds uh, and CTE funds, et cetera which are uh, funds that, that are uh, shared with the schools. Um, the basic uh, school budgets are based on a, on a per pupil funding amount. And we have uh, started to be able to increase that per pupil amount, um, but the only add-on 
that we currently have in the structure is for special ed. So, uh, and then there's a, for the special schools, there's a, uh, a much larger allocation for those four schools. Um, but apart from that uh, scale, it's per pupil per, at, at different rates for each level with the special ed add-on and then the other special programs. So it's, it's equal, uh, but I know uh, from Dr. Williams' perspective, it may not be equitable. Exactly, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, and next looks like we have um, Ms. Mack. Um, hi, Do I'm Dr. Saris. Hi, Mr. Saris. Um, just a couple of questions. I had presented to this committee, I don't know if you've seen it or you're aware of it, but just like an accounting of a many, many things at a school level. And I think there were like seven lines of dollars per school. But also included was like how many how many teachers, teachers to student ratio, counselor to student ratio, things like that. So we are still waiting for that information for us as a committee to be able to say whether we're equal or even equitable, just to have the data behind that. But a question that I asked through the budget process last year um, and really never got an answer, how when you talked about, I think you said physical services um, determined the needs and we allocated money for, we. it wasn't, it didn't get through to the end because of the maintenance of effort budget, but you, um, you determined that some schools had greater needs and I think they were considered focus schools. Right. How, how was that need determined and what was the criteria for uh, acknowledging or identifying a school as a focus school? So generally speaking, uh, and this is not fiscal services or business services, this takes place um, in uh, collaboration with the community superintendents, curriculum instruction, social emotional learning, um, et cetera. So the types of criteria that, that are considered are the mobility of students, the income of students, um, the uh, number of special education students or, or students with IEPs, um, English language learners, all of those uh, groups uh, go into, uh, they sort of create a, uh, a rating uh, that's been called different things over the years. And Dr. Scriven, having been at uh, Woodlawn Middle and Woodlawn High School, can probably tell you about, you know, how those factors affect managing a school and administering a school. But so we think that's a documented process with a documented scoring rubric. Um, it it has been, I have seen it in the past. As I said, I don't participate in the process yeah, from Joe, the fiscal me, standpoint. Yeah, let me jump in real quick. Ms. Mack, that, that's really on the school support side and, and not on the uh, fiscal side, just to be quite honest. But in terms of just being engaged in this conversation, one thing that I would put out for your consideration, I, I, I think you're right on target when you talk about focused schools. I know the only differentiated support that is really being afforded um, to focused schools right now is just a focused approach on uh, giving them additional uh, assistance as it relates to professional development as it relates to trying to build the capacity of their teachers uh, so that they can uh, subsequently have a greater impact on the student outcomes within those respective schools. So 
It's more of a laser focus based on wraparound services from a, a, a teaching and learning perspective that is infused in, in, in those schools. The issue is that um, it's not sustainable through an entire year. So you have to be very strategic with when you're doing that. You may try to front load that uh, in the beginning of the school year to really give that solid foundation which is needed, but it can't be maintained as there's there's more focus schools than the FTE to support them, just to be quite honest. So these are some of the questions or some of the things that you would want to look at uh, as an equity committee. As exactly, and that's as my you, point for bringing right. it up because um, right. I have asked for that data at a school level yeah. just to make sure that you know, schools are being given the resources that they need to be as successful as they can be. And and, uh, and when, you, when you, just not to cut you off, but I want to elaborate just on what you're saying, because I want to take you down that path. Is, oh, I want to go down that path. Have no, yes, no I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. It, it's not just about resources. Right now, there are no differentiated resources per se. And George, you can correct me um, if I'm wrong, but when you talk about policy or when you talk about uh, practices uh, that are systemic, once you get that data and you have an, an opportunity to disaggregate, um, are we then able to give those strategic positions which are needed to move where we've identified that there are gaps? And, and, and that right. would be really what the work uh, would entail, and I, I don't know if there's, I don't believe that there's a set process to do that right now. So I guess where I was going with that, when I saw Dr. Williams' budget last year, I was thrilled. I think I can even quote that there were 486 new positions added because I'm a person who thinks people make the difference. And then, of course, we were cut to a maintenance of effort. All of that was cut. But if we have a look at what our schools really look like, even in a confined maintenance of effort budget, we can look potentially at moving resources among our schools, um, which I know is budget neutral for you guys, but for us as an equity committee, it's something that we can look at. Um, real Ms. Ms. Matt, could I, add, could I add a process, um, some information that might be helpful? So currently the EDs, the executive directors of schools who oversee those schools and are, and are the evaluators of those principals, they play a key role in determining what schools are identified for additional resource support. Um, and, and that's because of their oversight of their, those, those schools. Uh, they understand, they meet with teachers, they meet with principals, um, they talk about what needs they've identified and in that process, they start to identify how we might overlay system resources. So at that sort of actionable uh, boots on the ground level is where we try to influence the most. And some of that, um, the initial identification is based simply on student performance as measured by MSDE or anybody else in how they rank school performance. Uh, but ultimately, the EDs provide a lot of influence in terms of what schools are identified for those supports um, based on, again, the review of student performance, but then interaction with the school and the principal to determine identified needs. I, I hope that's helpful, no, in, helpful. In, in, in how that list sort of is created. Um, okay, can I looks like Ms. Pastor wants to jump in there. Because I'm about to jump out of this chair. All okay. right. So Mr. Scriven and I both know this because, Ms. Ms. Mack, because we came from those schools, all right? The, what we're talking about is a systemic problem because there's a disconnect. You see, we're always planning in the current year, but when you're looking at the budget, you're planning for a year that has not happened, all right? So you, we are making, and, and even the directors, are speaking about needs based on what we're seeing in the moment. But that moment probably is not going to carry through or exist by that next school year. You can see that just in terms 
of the way our, our system populations change and uh, the, the numbers change. And as Mr. Sarah said, that department is not connected with the department that says, oh, I can see where the needs are. So by the time, and as Mr. Saris also said, it's a whole year process. So what, and, and this goes to your point perfectly, what we are talking about, let's say if we were in the real world now, what we're looking at now, next year, this time, is not gonna look the same. And that is, and, and, and they have planned, we have planned, based on what we are seeing in real time. Even when we were working on the Kerwin budget, we spent an enormous amount of time talking about that. Do we look, and let's talk enrollment, do we look at the enrollment based on the September 30th enrollment, or do we go to October? So, you see, if you look at our September 30th enrollment, our numbers look markedly down. But by the time we get to the end of this month, and let's say if all things were equal, we weren't in the middle of all of this, we would have a, a, an immeasurable, well, it is measurable, a measurable increase in terms of the population. So remember then, we didn't plan for that extra. So, Ms. Mack, when, when, as a principal, let's say I'm saying these are the things I need, there are some things that you can't touch, like special ed, you can't play with that, with that staffing. So you move around whatever you thought you were going to need the year before when the budget was done. Now you find yourself having to change your schedule, right, Brian? You are playing with your schedule. You're playing with your, um, you're finding that you're down in terms of staffing. Whatever you thought your needs were the last year, now you're see, you might see an influx of children with IEP needs and special needs that no one could have accounted for. And we have always complained that when we get the projection for enrollment, the, project, the projected number, Stop me, Brian, if I'm not telling the truth. The projected number was always low, and we always had more, okay? So um, it, it, it is, that's the conundrum. So if these departments, Ms. Mack, don't, if there's not some way, and I don't know because I don't understand anything that comes out of the schoolhouse, so, you know. Um, but if there's not that kind of communication, and I've heard Dr. Williams say that departments have to have that ongoing conversation with each other. And if we thought it was insanity before, it's going to be real crazy as we find ourselves coming out of this. That is the problem. We, we are planning forward but how children move and what their needs are, don't care how we're planning. Ms. Pasteur, I know you probably don't remember me saying this because it was one o'clock in the morning, um, but what I asked to be added to a future agenda is a very detailed look at the student's counts process um, because of exactly what you just said it seems to me that it's broken for any type of accurate projections of allocation of funding because by the time the school year happens, we cut it off on September 30th and we get this huge influx of students. We don't get money for them. We don't get staffing for them. And as you're saying, the principals are made to make it work. And so well, that is you why I'm asking for that. Yeah, you're right. Um, and you can ask after... Once you get into October, certainly you can ask and, and request um, right. a change right. in the staffing. Okay, but let me just say, whoo, glory, hallelujah. Ask me how many times I, I got what I asked. Okay, it didn't happen. So even though I love teaching, I taught two classes of English 
every year I was the principal. Two of my APs taught a class. No, yeah. and I'm glad we're talking about it, so th thank you for that input. Um, Ms. Scott, I did have two very general budget questions, and then I'm finished. Dr. Scriven, have we considered, just as we have cr uh, made the unions partners in the early process, have we considered making the board partners in the early process? The, the board can definitely make that recommendation. I, I, in isolation, have not made that consideration. So I, I want to I want to answer you as as truthfully as I as I as I'm able to do. And then my last question, having done budgets in my life, are we starting? Are we taking categories where we've allocated money and working from last year's budget, simply moving forward, or are we looking at every every category, saying we don't have we don't really even need this level of spending in this category? So we're not going to just add on a 2% increase. We're going to eliminate it or we're going to decrease it. Do we always start from what is and think of an increase to what is, or do we go back to what we really need in every category? I'm a, I'm a, that's a complex response that I'm going to let Mr. Saris answer. And George, when you're answering that, could you also explain how that is being monitored uh, bi-weekly as we're even moving throughout the school year, line item by line item. Ryan, would you mind if I made a comment first? Sure, sure, Billy. So, Mrs. Mack, I, I so appreciate that uh, question <laughs> and comment. Having been somebody that sat um, at, in an executive level position now for about nine years, we go through that budget line by line in order to identify whether we still need that expenditure or whether we can move it to a more appropriate place. We are so, it, be, because we have so many needs that we can't fulfill, um, it's imperative that we do that. And we don't do it once. We do it four times before that budget is submitted to you. Um, we, like everybody's called into the big room. We all sit around the table, George goes through the spreadsheet and we go line by line. Do you still need this? And if you don't, can we put it where we need it? Uh, that's a layman's version of probably the expla explanation that Mr. Saris is gonna give you now, but I just thought it would be important to hear from somebody who's like a practitioner in, in the process. Thank you very well, much. I'd just like to say to what Mr. Burke just said, that even before they do it, inside the school, we go through it. We have no dinner, no lunch, no life, because we sit and sit. I used to say to my peace, to look at tape, bring a picture of your family, because we're going to be locked in this room for a very long time, trying to figure out what those needs are, because we had to then turn those things over. Well, you still have the gap, but, you know, everybody was working and sweating bullets because, again, straight down the line, if we are not making excellence happen in the school, in the schools, not only and first and foremost do our children and our teachers suffer, but everybody else down the line, Mr. Burke, all the way down, they, everybody is being looked at as to what happened here, you know, and, and every school is saying the same thing. And it's almost out and, and, and in terms of staffing. And it's true, Mr. Burke and probably Mr. Scriven, though, we could sit at the principal's meeting where we got our staffing. And sometimes you talk about the inequity. I can remember uh, my good buddy, Jane, who used to get her staffing and say, I don't want, I don't want this number. Because if she got more, they had a good thing going on. And Tyrus and I, they had a good thing. She wasn't trying to mess up her thing. She knew just who was doing what, and when, and why, and how. And I'd raise my hand every year and say, can I have her teachers, please? So, you know, you're looking at those, and I call them the magic numbers, because sometimes we weren't seeing them. And it, But everybody, as Mr. Perth said, they were trying to figure out how you move it around, how you shift, how you make it happen. I find that insane that you have to go through all of this. 
when you're dealing with children's lives. But I just want to throw that in on this, what Mr. Burke was saying. He's right. Okay. Thank George. you, Ms. Castor. I think yeah. we're hearing from Mr. Saris now. I can, I'll give you a, 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 a summation, um, and we can talk more if you like, but it's a pretty brutal process. Um, and the, there is no inflationary adjustment index in this budget. We do not, uh, we go, f we start from scratch and, um, and this year, uh, as a, as an interesting example, that $5 million that the superintendent had, we all had to get together to come up with at the beginning of the year, when we gave everybody their starting budget for, from this year, it was $5 million short right from the get-go. So they're starting this process from uh, less than they started with last year. Um, and what we, we've always done is we've compared your, we've compared budget to budget, but we look at what your actual expenses were. And so when there's clearly, there wasn't a need for that entire budget, we, we have a process called redirecting funds. And every year there's a million or two or $3 million that we redirect. And we typically will highlight those in the budget document um, but I think, uh, what has really wrung the fat out of this budget is that, uh, after the last recession, uh, for four years, we had a maintenance of effort budget. And despite that, we were able to main, we maintained every program and we were able to provide some level of uh, compensation adjustments to staff. That was achieved by a very intense and lengthy process of, of trimming every possible account that we could find to do that. Um, and that was a very effective process, so effective that um, the, the county the county executive staff and the county council staff scrubs our budget after mm -hmm. we present it. They haven't recommended any additional cuts. And I think that's because there's just, we've been to the well so often on this um, that it's just about dry. Um, and I guess one comment that from the prior conversation about allocating the, the flexibility that we have to allocate resources to the neediest schools. And, and what Mr. Burke indicated is that yes, the, the, uh, the schools and human resources and the executive directors and the community soups, once the actual number of kids show up in September, and as, as Ms. Pastor said, it's, it's never exactly what we thought it was going to be, and it's never where exactly we thought it was going to be. We have to reshuffle staff to accommodate the change, you know, the actual enrollment that we get, and the schools that have real needs. Like one year, it was Perry Hall Middle School because they're bursting at the seams. They needed more teachers, more counselors. They even needed an. An they're under headcount. Right. So, but what we've always, we have built within the staffing ratio that you also see in the budget document gives human resources some flexibility to move teachers. We have some teachers that we can move, not individuals, but right. spots. FTEs. Right. And this year that was almost impossible because we didn't, we didn't even get enough teachers to maintain our exactly. class sizes. And that was significant. That was 90 teachers, 97 teachers, half of which are special ed. So 
This year, we just didn't have that flexibility, and it really, it's, it's really going to impact our, you know, this committee's efforts, you know, to respond to the equitable needs. There's so little flexibility. Thank you, Mr. Sarris. Sure. Yes, thank you so much for that, Mr. Sarris, and everyone um, with your questions and um, and Mr. Sarris and. Um, with your explanation. Um, I guess for me, my question would be, I heard um, a few key things were, uh, one, where Mr. Sarris, where you said uh, maybe equal but not equitable, which is interesting. Um, but also, and I also heard how you said, uh, or both of you all, you and Dr. Scriven said policy 100 um, is in there. But what I would like to know is with the... Um, the policy, how does it apply to the system? How are you applying O100 in your decision making um, and in, in your work and, and, and in everything? I, I hear it, I hear the word equitable or, or, or I hear policy O100, but I'd like to see an example or hear an example of actually how it is applied. And, and I think, Ms. Scott, that goes back to the original uh, opening statement that I made, that we are the facilitators of the process. So what I'm saying to you, as we're working with CNI, as we're working with the other offices, all, all we're doing is bringing financially to life what they need to happen. And it is our hope that they are the ones that are looking at this through an equitable lens. Uh, I'm just, we, we, we are not the ones that make that decision. I, I, I hope that helps. That's, that's why I started with what I said in terms of, of explaining we're facilitation and support. Okay. And bringing those visions based on their work of looking at data, looking at programmatic needs, school to school, to bringing that to life, whether it is new uh, curriculum and instruction, whether it's books, the all those resources and materials, we just figure out how to pay for that to make it happen. Uh, I'm so would Ms. Scott's question okay. be directed to the area superintendents? Is that what you would suggest, Dr. Scriven? It's it's really across the board. It's it, yeah. it can't be answered in isolation. It is mm -hmm. a it is a systemic question that you would have to actually ask division by division, departments within those divisions, and then every office that lies within those respective departments. I'm just being okay. And yes, and I appreciate that. So what you're saying is is that the question that I asked, how equity or policy 0100 is being applied system-wide, like you said, a systemic, is something that would have to be asked division to <laughs> division right. to each one of how they are applying it, not just using the term equitable or equity, but actually how it's being implemented and applied. Now, I'm going to use my division as an example. Okay. Uh, uh, because you did ask for an example. So yes. right now, currently, we are developing our office progress plans. I'm sorry, you said that office progress plan? Yes, our office progress plan. So just like you have your school progress plan on the school side, you have your office progress plans on the business support side. So we are operating through the lens of continuous improvement in terms of how we go about doing business just as it's being done on the school side. And one of the things that I'm working with directly with Dr. Williams and her office as we're developing those plans is making sure that you can see where equitable practices are a part of those plans. Those are going to be living documents. So as we're identifying gaps in our services, we also have to figure out, so what are we going to do from a training standpoint, from a professional development standpoint, to give our faculty and staff the, uh, the tools, the skill set, the capacity 
to make sure that we are being equitable in the work that we're doing on a daily basis. So that uh, we just had a meeting last week in, in response to this with with one yes. officer. Yes, and, 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 and Dr. Yeah. Williams, you yeah. had something. If to I could you. jump in and actually give a, a kudo to Dr. Scriven um, for the process that he's observing. Because part of the challenge, as I see it with um, the project that he's lifting up, is that it's not intuitive, as you think about facilities, to apply an equity lens, right? And so in those cases where people are trying to go from theory, and to your point, Ms. Scott, not just saying the word equity a thousand times, but actually <laughs> trying to figure out, like, what does that mean in the context of this work? Our department can serve in thought partnership and say, okay, you know, schools exist in communities. Some communities have been disinvested in, so they are food deserts. Um, there's not green space. There, you know, these kinds of things. These are the things uh, around spatial considerations and equity that as we're planning, you might want to figure out how to codify, in which case we are doing a direct application of 0100 in ways that make sense um, in, in particular uh, contexts. Um, so I just wanted to lift up this as an example of what it looks like to really have those things be fleshed out in a very thoughtful way that is rooted in the research and the evidence about how we should be thinking about those things. So um, what I'm hearing is, is that Dr. Scribbins is doing that and fleshing it out and applying it in his division through, I think he called it the Alters Progress Plan. Okay, when did that start? Is that something new or has that been ongoing or is that a new initiative? They used to be called scorecards, from what I'm, from what I'm understanding, um, and now they're 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 improvement plans. That's what that's what they are. You, we're identifying where we see gaps in services, and we're coming up with corrective measures in which we're going to monitor to make sure that we are re that we are reaching the targets or the goals that we are setting. This is all aligned with the compass. Mm -hmm. And for us, we're under uh, goal five or focus five, uh, operational excellence. And it's through that lens that each one of the departments within my division are developing plans which speak specifically to their work. My responsibility as chief is to make sure that those equitable practices mm -hmm. can be visibly seen. And, and not, so, so they have to be actionable. How are they operational? You know, uh, you- Can you, you give me an example of one of an equitable practice that could be visibly seen that you're uh, making sure is visibly seen? Yeah, so so right now the the, the piece, and we only have one, I only have one plan that, that's in right now, um, which is uh, facilities, right? Mm -hmm. So as we're looking, uh, through the lens of, of facilities, uh, my my charge, <laughs> Ms. Pastor is going to laugh. We we so there's certain schools in certain areas that are neglected. I, I can't put it any other way. So part of what I'm responsible for doing is making sure that that playing field is being leveled. So as I'm meeting one on one with my executive directors and looking at the different reports that they are producing, it's my responsible to, responsibility to ask those questions where I'm seeing charities. And, and that's part of the work. Somebody else might have a mic on. But that's, a, that's an example. One-on-one -on -one with EDs, if I'm seeing gaps or issues, I'm honing in on why do we have this many open orders that have not been uh, mm -hmm. completed at this school and over here, their 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 percentage is uh, considerably less. Those are conversations. I'm I'm digging in and getting into the root causes as to why. So and is, and is that put together into like a report that could be maybe presented to this committee at a at a later time? Um, with it's some not, um, you like you like immediate reports, so I'm scared to answer that question. <laughs> with you. This, this is a. This is a continuous improvement process. So this is what I would really ask of you. Give me a, give me time to at least go through um, bringing what is new for all um, to light. I would not mind 
be opposed at all to reporting out at end of year once we've had the opportunity to carry through um, an inten uh, a one year a cycle, which Certainly. is not supposed to be a full year. But I could speak to we can highlight what those office plans were. We can highlight the goals. We can highlight how we monitor them and what the process was for us in terms of making sure that we were making the incremental improvements that we wanted to see. Okay, yes, that sounds good, yes. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, ma'am. It looks like uh, Dr. Hager, you had your hand up? Yes. Uh, yeah, I just had a follow-up question about these, um, these progress plans. And since they are aligned with the Compass, will every office have to report on equity that is part it's part of the form or whatever that is the expectation without a doubt i'm 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 a i view myself i've always been an equity warder it's personal for me so i want to make sure i've been on the other side for the majority of my career i now have an opportunity to bring about some positive changes that should be happening on this side and so you can see I'm emotional about it. I'm, I'm passionate about it. Th this is the work. This this is what um, has to be done. So, but to answer your question, yes, without a doubt, we're all being held accountable for them. And, awesome. and the Thank woman you. in the middle, the middle of the box, is the one that's leading that charge, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I see Miss Pastor has her hand up. Watch, I'm gonna put it down now. Watch. Bam. Okay. All right. Uh, and, and what Dr. Scriven just described, I think, I, I don't want to jump in your head, uh, Mr. Saris, is the difference in this regard between equal and equitable. Because we dole out, but given one school the same piece of the pie as another one might not service that particular school. So that's the, you are doing the equitable work, taking a look, because too long in some of our schools, folks thought if we can just patch the roof so it doesn't rain inside when it's raining outside, patch the roof, all is well. And it gets ignored, and other schools get built up around it because you just keep patching it. And I just want to make sure, just to put in my quick bid, that don't be confused by a little paint and maybe some books on the shelf. The school still is ragged and still hasn't been, had a new, had any renovation since 1967. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Mack, you see your hands up? Dr. Scriven, I would just like to throw out a challenge to you. My children attended an elementary school, the same elementary school that my father-in-law attended. And my father-in-law, if he were alive, would be 102. My children are moving up towards their 40s. So I share Ms. Pasteur's concern that um, I, I think the school's well-maintained, but uh, you know, I think we do have schools that have somehow been lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So I and would, I look forward to seeing your report. And I mean, that's, it's just a little neighborhood school, but mm -hmm. it's that old. And it's, looks like it did when my kids went there. <laughs> and, and, and Ms. Mack and, and to uh, the other board members that are represented on this call, I think it's imperative that we really understand the challenge of, of lack of funding. Um, oh no, I, I know. No, but that that is the issue. The and this has been this has been longstanding. This is not a this is not a new a new issue in terms of when we're looking at preventive maintenance and the things that we need to do. It is truly a, a challenge and. As we even look at budget, we're MOE this year. I can almost guarantee that we'll be MOE again next year. Um, it, it, it just really puts us in, in a tough situation. And, and that's part of what I'm grappling with right now. 
I've always been in positions, even as an administrator, uh, to have to do more with less. I find myself, even at this level, grappling with having to figure out how do we possibly do uh, more with less. And uh, so, uh, can I, can I, yeah. yeah. So several Thanks, things. Williams. Yeah, so one of the things I, I think is really important to say, um, as a person who's been, again, studying these issues for a while, the, the budget has been con contracting for years, right? The, the budget is contracting, and we have more people, um, the, the, the population of students that we serve don't look like the tax base that funds the school system. So these phenomena are, are, are again, for you, Dr. Scriven, this is like a new thing that, that you're tackling. But one, the reason I'm raising this issue is that the, when we apply a lens of equality to circumstances that are inequitable, we exacerbate the, the challenges that we have. And we've not developed the discipline to do the strategic work of dealing with the implications of a contraction. That, oh, by the way, every year we're having conversations about a, a contracting budget. And so at some point, we have to develop some way of being that is responsive to these conditions, because stating them is not going to change them. This question of being operative in them are, is something that we had plenty of opportunities to really wrestle with to figure out what we feel is the right way to be in, under these circumstances. So I just wanted to lift that up. And Dr. Scriven, I'm not holding you personally responsible. I just threw that out there. I promise I'm not. No, no, but I, I, I do feel it's a heavy weight. I feel it. And uh, I felt it as a principal. You know, I, I had the charge that I had to think out of the, the box to do whatever was necessary to meet the needs. Um, and it was a very fine line because I'll be very honest and I'll speak my truth to you guys. And that's what sometimes gets me in trouble is my transparency. Um, when the system wasn't meeting the need, I had to figure out how to meet the need in other ways. And um, uh, and I don't want that to be the, the narrative that we're currently living on. So uh, that that's really where I am. So uh, again, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. It's, it's 519. I'm supposed to jump to be on another public call with Pete Dixit. Um, I don't. Hopefully, George, I can leave you by yourself, sir, and I can ask for your <laughs> uh, permission to excuse myself from this meeting. If there's no other, you guys are my priority, so let me be clear with that. Um, uh, but if permission can be granted, I do need to jump on another one. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Scriven. Thank you so much. Appreciate your passion and you being here and everything that you said. I, I, I just want to make sure that's clear because... Um, uh, it's it's very clear how you feel and what your priority is. So um, I think I speak for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I look forward to continuing working with you all. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Everyone stay safe. Thank you. You too. Yep, so, okay. Um, and, um, oh, I'm sorry, were there any other questions around this? Lisa, it looks like your hand, Miss Mack, your hand is still up. Oh, yeah, sorry. it looks like your hand is still up. No, sorry. Okay, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anyone um, uh, before we moved along um, with that. I think that was that was very um, informative, and I do look forward to the report that he spoke of um, at the. I guess he he called it the office progress plan. That that at the end of the year, I think that would be um, fascinating. I would look forward to seeing that. Can I just ask a clarifying yes. question, please? And to Mr. Saris, are we talking about the end of the calendar year or the fiscal year? Uh, the fiscal year. Fiscal. Okay. So when would we, ex as a board, expect to see that report? Realistically, to give you guys time. Um, well, I would say. Yeah. You know, but between June and August would be my guess. I mean, my yeah, it sounded. You all would definitely need some. It, well, I, it would definitely yeah. take some time to gather it, to put it together, and to have results with which to report back. So, um, I think that would be fascinating and also good to share, even um, with the full board. Right. And there are other office. All the offices are doing these reports, correct? So right. maybe scheduling. Yeah. 
all of them. I mean, just as an example, Dr. Scriffin's division processes over 4,000 work orders a year. It's just an four immense- 4,000? 4,000. Wow. You know, and the the IT depart the IT department easily does ten times that. So um, they're very uh, customer service oriented operations. Great. Well, thank you. Well, I think that um, also includes the third part of our agenda, which was. Uh, to have comments and questions on the budget construction process, which I believe um, uh, we did all that and the team, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Scriven and um, Mr. Sarris basically, um, I feel, explained that to us. So the last part of the agenda, I mean, that would basically include our meeting, um, but I'd like to know if there's any comments or, or any uh, further business or um, any questions or suggestions that anyone may like to offer for um, our next meeting? Dr. Hager? Um, sure, so uh, I was actually texting uh, with Ms. Scott about this the other day. Um, yes. So <laughs> uh, a question for Dr. Williams. The um, It sounds like when you do the equity trainings in schools, the, the goal is to create committees within schools that then you know, work on these issues within buildings. Um, and so that model reminded me a lot of, of a lot of work that I do, which has to do with wellness teams and school health councils uh, within districts. And so one thought, since we are a new committee and, you know, still trying to get, kind of figure out where we stand, um, is whether there could be some sort of a connection between our committee and these school level equity teams. Um, you know, it's, it needs to be fleshed out and thought about a little bit more, but um, but just thinking that having uh, the voices of the people that are in the buildings doing the work, um, either formally as part of the committee or if it's, you know, quarterly, we get together, you know, like as if there's some way to kind of make that connection. It also might formalize the school level committees a little bit more. And I don't know, just just some general ideas. Yeah. No, and um, I think that's a, a, a for Dr. Williams. I think that is a, a great idea. Um, Dr. Hager and I had spoken about that as far as maybe starting a. Um, community stakeholder group that would come out of this equity committee where like uh, Dr. Hager was saying that would include the schools, but also parents and um, uh, teachers and uh, maybe even community organizations that would serve as like an advisory group to, to this committee. So really quickly um, in response to that, uh, not only do schools have those teams, but central office staff should have those teams as well. And one of the extensions of our work systemically this year is um, collaborating with leadership development to offer a recursive series of training around highly um, high functioning teams. Because equity teams, while schools have teams and offices have teams that function um, in the normal, the normal sense of like a hierarchical organization, equity teams um, operate maximally when you flatten leadership because you need to democratize the space so that all perspectives are valued in the same way. So from the janitor to the bus driver to the, you know, like we got to, because oftentimes the people who are holding the information around challenges in buildings are the, the most, the ones with the least amount of power. And so on equity teams, that should not be the phenomena. So we're going to, we're going to do some work this year to try to maximize their our collective ability to function in teams in a different way. So I would love to have this team have a sense of what that is looking like for us. My hypothesis is we have done a lot of work around awareness and even like what people should be doing. The question is how effective are our vehicles of translation? And our argument is the team is the unit of translation in both schools and offices. Okay, can that be added to our next agenda? Um, to Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost, it's kind of like two ideas. So one is the, the equity teams in the buildings, and then the other one would be this community stakeholder group, if that's something else that we thought. I mean, they, they could be, it's kind of like a Venn diagram, maybe, but, you know, they're, they're, they're different, but uh, but similar. So maybe two, two items on the agenda for next time. Thank you. I think that could be doable to flush both out, to have them as, as, as two items. But would that be, um, does that sound feasible, Dr. Williams? If whatever you all want in terms of a follow-up discussion. Now, let me also say, 
um, as a matter of following up from our last discussion, we had Title I teacher retention, academics, um, reading to learn versus learning to read, and then mm -hmm. um, a summary of our equity training. So, Ms. Scott, if, if you're okay with this, I'll add these two items, and then we can make some decisions around chronology of these presentations. Okay. Okay. So I'm work? fine with that. I think that would, that would work well. Thank okay. you. Okay. And it looks like, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hager, did you, were you finished? Okay. <laughs> okay. It looks like Lisa, uh, Ms. Matt, your hand is up. Um, Dr. Williams, I just wanted to close the loop on uh, some conversation that occurred at the board meeting. Um, some people like high level information and some people want to look at the data and we don't need to answer it here. And I guess this is to both you and Ms. Scott, but I do think we have to have a process for providing the underlying data to those people who are data people. I can't hear you, Dr. Williams. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Certainly, the four-year-old will be here at any moment, so I go on mute uh -oh. to save you all. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I will speak to Dr. Uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillips about how we make available the underlying reports um, at your leisure, because to to the point that came up at the board meeting, those reports exist, um, mm -hmm. but we're just reporting on the reports. So um, if there is that request, I will share that with her. Thank you very much. And um, just thank you for this meeting. Yes. Is that something, just to follow up on what Ms. Mack said, would that be something that we would then present to the full board or would that be something that would be attached, um, I, I guess, think as an item? Asking for it. That's why I, I, a number of people on the board were asking for yes. it. So sure. I think it would have to go to the full board. I guess I was just thinking of the vehicle by which it would go. Is that something we would present at a board meeting out of this committee. Um, so I mean, we don't have to decide now, but I, that's right. what I was gonna, thinking about. Yeah, I was going to um, raise this issue to both the superintendent and Dr. Wheatley Phillips, because I think that it, an easy answer is that, that those reports always exist. That's how we can tell you about the findings. Um, sometimes what happens is it's multiple reports that we're, we're reporting on. So I'll just take that back and then they'll let us know how to proceed. Um, okay. Right Thank you. Um, Mrs. Pastor? Yes. Um, I'd like uh, Dr. Williams, and really not at the next meeting, or maybe not even at the meeting after that, okay? But I would like you to just wrap your head around for the future um, what you have been doing, what suggestions and directions you make in terms of uh, parental involvement because it's been mentioned, but we really don't embrace it. We keep pulling, we pull the same parents who are on this committee, who are vocal, who are present, and we are not speaking to the reality that these children are ours because they go, they're in our system, but they're not really ours, and they go home. And it, when they go home, their parents need to embrace what goes on in the school day. And one of the reasons I brought up the dyslexia and the dysgraphia, the whole nine yards, is I can guarantee I'm not you, I'm not uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, but I'd put money on the fact that if you pull up numbers that show from this county how many of our children fall in those categories, they, there'd be very few children of color. The, and for a number of reasons, because as you said at the beginning, we transfer that not just in school, but at home. Parents are saying to their children, he's bad, he gets in trouble all the time. He's this, he's slow, he's blah, blah, blah. And we need to help them rid themselves of the terminology and the mindset but they need to hear it. They need to know those terms. And we also have to understand that historically, and I think I said it Tuesday, African-American children very often were put into special ed classes unless they were like this. Um, a Congressman Cummings spoke to that. We can name any numbers who do that. So we have to help our parents understand 
who they are and who their children really are, because that's going to make a difference. And that is different than inviting a few parents in. And not that I have a problem with them being a part of any support, but we need to do something for parents and, and how, we, how we help them embrace this, this thinking. So okay. I would love for you at some point to talk about that in that whole scale. Please. Oh, I, I could go on and on about this. And so I will be mindful for the fact that it's 532. Um, but absolutely, I jotted that down. Got it, Ms. Pastro. Thank you. Ms. Mack, is your hand back up? We can't hear you. You're I'm muted, Ms. Mack. Because my face is obliterated by the sun. <laughs> okay. Your hand is up. I didn't know. Oh, no, okay. I'm trying to just figure out what's going on. <laughs> Okay. You're the Lone Ranger. I know. That's why. Look, I have a permanent mask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. I mean, I, this was a very robust conversation, and um, I feel like um, we got a lot accomplished, and I learned a lot. Um, so, but that includes the agenda for the Equity Committee um, at uh, 5:31. And um, since there's no further business, do I have a motion um, to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Uh, of a second, second past, past you. Thank you. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye bye.